Hi, welcome back. It's time for a light-hearted session, don't you think? The world's going to hell in a handbasket, markets are in turmoil. You know what I want to talk about? I want to talk about weed. Weed, of course, is the sector that's taken off in the last few months. You might have heard about of Tilray, the Canadian cannabis stock that went public and went up tenfold in the weeks after. So let's talk a little bit about how times have changed. I'm old enough to remember a time when Bill Clinton was running for president and he was asked whether he'd ever smoked weed. And his response was that he smoked, but he did not inhale, reflecting the fear that if people thought he'd smoke weed, they wouldn't elect him. Well, today, if you're a politician, smoking weed might humanize you. It's considered a good thing. In fact, in the U.S., there are nine states now, including California, where I live, where smoking weed is legal and 29 states where medical marijuana is legal. Times certainly have changed and businesses have caught on and investors seem to be on the bandwagon. In fact, many of the companies that have been listed in this sector are young companies with very little in revenues, but large market capitalizations reflecting the hope that people have, that the desire that people have to smoke weed will translate to profits. Now, like Bill Clinton, you can ask me whether I've smoked weed and I'm gonna answer. I've never smoked weed, but I'm inhaled. How is that possible? Well, I live in San Diego and all I need to do is walk down the beach boardwalks and with secondhand smoke, you can get pretty high. And I'm also you know, at a stage in my life where I don't want to get high. That said, let's take a look at where this legislation is coming from and why it is being, uh, what's motivating it. In fact, the reason for my post today is tomorrow, October 17th, Canada is going to legalize the recreational use of marijuana. Now, why are Canadians doing it? Well, it turns out that a lot of Canadians already smoke weed. In fact, the Canadian census, and know why they'd ask this question, asks Canadians whether they smoke weed, and 42.5% of Canadians admitted to have smoking weed, and 16% did it on a fairly regular basis. Now, Canadians are already mellow, and if they're smoking weed, I'd hate to see how much mellower they can get. Along the way, people are spending a lot of money. Even prior to legalization, you know, the sales of marijuana in Canada, they amounted to five, five and a half billion in 2017. And with legalization, the revenues from this business are expected to increase to seven to eight billion. It's not a small business. Now, Colorado and California are the two states in the US with the longest history of weed smoking. California, mostly illegally, and Colorado since 2014, it's been legal to smoke marijuana on a recreational basis. Let's see what we've learned from these two states about what legalization does to the business. In California, weed became legal at the start of 2018, and the world did not shift. In fact, one of the interesting things that's been noticed in California is the revenues from weed have not jumped dramatically since 2017, even though weed is now legal. It's not as if a lot more people are now smoking than they used to. They might, have, might be smoking it more openly than they did, but you didn't see a big jump in the smoking of weed. In Colorado, recreational marijuana use has been around since 2014, and there's some, some numbers that have built up. The revenues from, from weed have grown from a, from a little less than a billion dollars in 2015 to almost a billion and a half in 2017. Solid growth, but not spectacular growth. Now, why am I saying all of this? If there's a lesson to be learned from looking at the markets where we where cannabis has been legalized, the first is that the illegal market doesn't disappear once legalization shows up. In California, the reason for that is twofold. One is the costs of legal weed, it turns out, are much higher than the cost of illegal weed. Why? Because there's testing, there's regulation, there's taxes. So you're paying a lot more for legal weed. And second, the culture of many long time big weed smokers is not exactly a culture that gives a lot of respect to legality. So there's a culture of, of buying and using weed that might be very difficult to change overnight. There will be growth in this business, but the growth is going to be, if, if the experience holds, going to be a lot more muted than people think, especially in the recreational the portion of the business. The, and so I think that's got to be kept in mind as you start valuing companies in this business. As for medical marijuana, I think the growth there is going to be driven by the way, you know, like the pharmaceutical business. It's driven by regulation and whether in fact it is uh, turning out to be something that's useful in treating pain or whatever else it works out to treat. 
And the other thing we've learned, at least from the U.S. states that have legalized marijuana, is as long as the federal laws are not the same as the state laws, you're going to have a problem running businesses. In other words, you know, growing and selling cannabis might be legal in California, but if it's illegal in 41 states, it's very difficult for a company that operates across state lines to run businesses that can do this. In fact, in the U.S., one of the problems that this business has run into is financial service companies, which tend to be federally regulated, have been reluctant to capitalize the business. In other words, it's difficult to go to one of the big money center banks and take a loan if you're setting up a cannabis business. So the, as long as the federal and the state laws are at war with each other, we're going to have a gigantic constraint on the growth of this business, at least in the U.S. So here's the business question. We all agree that the cannabis business, the weed business, is going to be a big business going forward. The question is, are all big businesses profitable business? The answer is no. You can have a big business that's not value creating if there are no ways of creating excess returns, no competitive advantages, barriers of entry that companies within each business, within that business can come up with. So if you're an investor in this space, you need to think about what companies in the space can do to set themselves apart, to make themselves different from other companies. So you have to make some judgments about how the business will evolve and how companies within the business will evolve for this to play. So you're, 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 I think you have to separate the recreational marijuana business and the med medicinal marijuana business. In the recreational marijuana front, I think that the businesses you need to look up to as models are alcohol and tobacco. After all, these businesses had roots very much like the marijuana business, which is they've been around a long time. People have used them. They're legal, but there is this wink and a nod towards a side cost that they create. So over time, these businesses have acquired regulations and constraints. And my guess is the same constraints and regulations are coming to the marijuana business, at least in the recreational front. The question then is within the business, how will it change? Because there are two ways this business can evolve. One is like the tobacco business, the alcohol business, it can become a business where companies set themselves apart through marketing and branding. The Altrias or the Philip Morris of the world have done this over the last century. Maybe that's a path to go, in which case the companies that will succeed, that will be more the most valuable, will be the companies with the best marketing and branding skills. The other path that this business could follow is it becomes a commodity business. And there it'll, it's going to be the low cost the companies with the lowest cost and economies of scale that are going to win. I'm not sure which way this business will evolve, but you have to make a judgment on the evolution to make a bet on which companies will win. As far as the medical marijuana business, I think it's very much like the pharmaceutical business. It has to start off with research on, dr on drugs that include cannabis that turn out to be better than existing drugs. You've got to go through the FDA approval process which is going to be long and time consuming and cash burning. The companies that are going to succeed in this will be the companies with the best R&D departments, but in addition, they will need access to capital from investors who are willing to wait a long time, very much in the strands of what makes for successful pharmaceutical companies. So very different kinds of companies in the two businesses, which leads me to believe that you're going to see very few businesses kind of Mirror, uh, enter both and succeed in both. You're going to have to pick as a company which of these two businesses you want to succeed in because they require very different skill sets and very different, uh, very different ways of running the company. So if you're an investor, here's what you see. If I look at the largest marijuana companies and largest in terms of market cap, here's what I see. Most of them are Canadian right now, which tells you something about how the war between state and federal laws is keeping U.S. companies from coming to the forefront. Most of them are Canadian. Most of them have very little in revenues and lots of losses. Now, before you freak out as a value investor saying, this is awful, this is irrational exuberance, notice that this is not uncommon in young, young businesses. Companies with small revenues and big operating losses are what you'd expect to see. They have huge market caps relative to their revenues. And the question is, would you invest in this business? Now, there are two ways you can enter, you can play this, play this game. One is to be a trader. This is, after all, a trading game. Most young businesses are. What does that mean? Well, what drives the prices of stocks in this segment are not fundamentals, are not expected revenues and profits. 
it's very much mood and momentum about the sector and incremental information, small pieces of fairly trivial news that will drive stock prices all over. If you're a good trader, you can detect shifts in momentum, get ahead of it. You can make a lot of money, both on the upside and the downside, playing the stocks as they move up and down. I'm a terrible trader. I'm not going to try this. As an investor, you have three choices. The first is to make a macro judgment about how these businesses will evolve and pick a micro, a company that you think is best positioned to take advantage of that macro development. So as an example, if you believe that recreational marijuana is going to become a commodity business, you might look at a stock like Canopy Growth, which is one of the largest, um, the largest cannabis companies out there, which is investing a lot in the growth space and reducing the costs and economies of scale and saying, hey, that's a company I'm going to invest in. If you're right about the evolution of the sector and the company you pick, this could be by far the most profitable way to play this game. It's like picking Amazon as the winner from the dot-com sector in 99. You could have gone through the downturn and still emerged as a huge winner. But for this, you need to have a view about how the sector will evolve and which company will pick it. The second choice is to say, look, I don't know what the future will bring, but this business is going to get bigger and more profitable. So one thing you could do here is rather than put your money on one company, you could buy a bunch of companies in the space, create a portfolio. In fact, there is an ETF called MF that you can use that, that invests primarily in cannabis stocks, in which case you're going to ride the sector. The constraint, the, uh, the upside here is you just have to be right about the overall sector. The downside is the sector is evolving. New companies keep coming in. So you might have picked all the companies that are out there, but the winner might be out of that mix. It might be a new company that's not entered the mix yet. This is a third choice. And this is for somebody who wants to split the difference between wanting to be in the space and not wanting to take too much of a risk on how the space will evolve. And this is to pick a company that's in a different business, but has a cannabis arm. I'll give you one company that might surprise you. Scott's Miracle Grow. Many of you have probably used its products to make your lawn look better, right? You know that Scott's Miracle Grow has a subsidiary called Hawthorne, which, which is in the cannabis business. 10% of Scott's revenues last year came from the cannabis business. The other is GW Pharmaceuticals, a pharmaceutical company which has two big drugs built around cannabis. You could invest in those companies and try to get the benefits of the cannabis business on this side. It's not a full bet, so the payoff is going to be smaller, but you're also going to get less of a downside because there's another business providing the capital and the cash flows to sustain you. Now, I'll give you my choices. I have very, I mean, this might just reflect my age. I really don't know how this business will evolve. I can't tell you the difference between good weed and bad weed, no. So since I have no idea, it'd be dangerous for me to take a stand on how the business will evolve and what company will win. I considered buying the ETF, and but the problem is if you look at how much the ETF has gone up in the last few months, I'll be buying it at a high price. So if there's a big correction in the sector, I might be inclined to buy it, but at today's prices, I think it's it's just too expensive. I did consider buying Scott's Miracle Grow. In fact, I did a valuation of the stock. The stock's trading at about 70, and I valued it with at about 55. And this is incorporating some of the benefits of being in the cannabis business. At, at $70, I wouldn't buy it, but if the stock dropped to 45 or 50, I'd be inclined to add it onto my portfolio. It's not there yet. But you know what? As federal laws change, I think you're going to see more established players enter the cannabis business. I wouldn't be surprised if you saw the tobacco stocks that have already been tarred and feathered entering the business. What, what, what do you have to lose? You already know the business. You know the kinds of challenges you will face. So I wouldn't be surprised if you saw more big players enter this business. So I'm willing to wait and uh, I'll keep watching. And thank you very much for listening.